Welcome everyone. Um, today we have the honor um, to have with us uh, Marcel Lefers. Welcome. Thank you so much. Happy to be here with you, Mike. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. So I guess, you know, if we want to use the time the best way that we can, maybe we should go to the first one initially. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> a lot to cover. It's very simple, but maybe complicated. Um, how would you describe yourself or who you are and what you do? And yeah, let's start with that and then we can describe go. myself. Okay, sure. Um, well, I, um, I think of myself as what Buckminster Fuller called a comprehensivist as, a, as opposed to a specialist, mm -hmm. you know, and, and our educational system is geared towards, um, educating people to, be, to specialize in a certain field, to get their degree in one field and even a very narrow part of a field of study. And um, I, by divine synchronicity, I would say, <laughs> was exposed to Buckminster Fuller's ideas, who was a, a, an amazing um, thinker and designer and architect and innovator and poet and inventor uh, of the last century. And so when I was 19, I got exposed to his ideas in my first year of college or after my first year of college. And one of the most profound that influenced me and does to this day is this idea of being a comprehensivist. So to think in terms of whole systems and the wholeness of life. And so if I were to describe myself in this moment, that's, that's what comes to mind in terms of the essence of what, how I, uh, how I view life and how I view even myself and all the relationships of life that, um, you know, that we can see and we can explore as we go deeper into the topics today. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. And I'm also a musician and musician is very much, uh, music is very much a, a whole system awareness. Um, so that has been another way of uh, experiencing and in a way training myself with that same kind of thinking. And it's part of what we are going to be talking about, right? Through the yes. work you do, right? It, it sure um, is. One question came to me when you were talking. You were talking about by synchronicity. By synchronicity, what do you mean with that? Synchronicity, well, um, I don't know what the formal definition would be no, of that term. Mean, but why did you think it was a synchronicity that came? Oh, oh I, why did I, I think it was a synchronicity? Because... I, at the time when I was 19, I, prior to that in my life, I didn't really like reading books. And so I had read only a few books really uh, up until that point. And um, uh, preceding this synchronicity in my life, I had in my first year of college, um, what I call a frying pan over the head waking up experience that happened like one night. Um, and from that moment on, I knew something was different <laughs> and something, something bigger was going on. And I had, I, and it was, it's been a path of discovery since then. And it still is. Um, and so in that sort of awake and in inquisitive state of mind, uh, when I went home that summer to my parents' house, I, I felt like reading a book. And so I went to their library in the house and looked around and I found this book called Intuition by oh. Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> and and I, I thought, wow, I, I didn't know who Buckminster Fuller was, but I, I, I guess maybe it was just the title or whatever drew me to it. And when I read that book, it was really truly one of the most profound moments of my life mm -hmm. and uh, it guided Buckminster Fuller's thinking has guided me all these years and in that moment it helped explain to me um, why for example why I really didn't like school and what felt important to me and and set kind of a tone of a grounded awareness of this holistic thinking right in that moment, reading that book. And so I really feel like uh, mm -hmm. all, everything led me to that synchronous moment right then and there. Hmm. I'm glad that I asked. <laughs> uh, yeah. Interesting. 
So, um, should we start with uh, the definition of cosmometry? And sure. Uh, yeah, I would love to go into that incredible concept that you've been working on. Thank you. Um, so, yes, cosmometry is a word that um, I thought I had actually made it up. Um, and I was looking for a different word than for this field of knowledge um, than what's typically called sacred geometry. Very popular term, sacred geometry, uh, used very widely. Um, and with the kind of the research I had done and my roots in that whole field of awareness, it felt to me that that was an inade inadequate term for really the importance of this field of study and the greater breadth of the field of study, including Buckminster Fuller's work, which is really not in the sacred geometry uh, per se. Um, and so I, many, many years ago, was like, oh, there's got to be another name for this. And so I, I realized it was, you know, geometry, geo means earth, measuring earth. That's its basic fundamental meaning. And so I thought, well, this is really cosmic. It goes beyond the earth. And so I thought of this word cosmometry and I thought it was kind of funny sounding <laughs> at the time. And when I did a Google search on it, um, I discovered that, first of all, there were only about six actual references to that word. Everything else, there was lots of other things that were just dictionary definitions. Um, but in terms of like a, a scientific paper, actually most of them were from channeled writings from masters from the Syrian star system. <laughs> so that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I discovered that this word has been around for a few hundred years, but is not in use and is actually, I think, the appropriate name for this field of knowledge. And so the, 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 the traditional definition is the art of measuring the world or universe, which is fine. And I love that it's an art, the art of measuring the world and the universe. It's, it's, and it's a science, of course. Um, I kind of broadened that into the study of the fundamental patterns and structures and processes and systems and principles that underlie this uh, manifesting, the manifesting universe at all scales. So it's the cosmic um, relational aspects that we can see very specific and um, repeatable patterns within in nature especially, but also throughout the entire cosmos. And so it's the study of, of those patterns and structures and processes as a whole. Mm. Did you know when you started to study all of that, your mission with it in some way? Were you, because you talk about a bigger vision, I believe, and you know, hope and what we can do with all of that mm -hmm. once we have the awareness. Do you have some kind of like sense starting to work into that of what would come next with what is possible or it kind of like one thing develop into another, you know? Yes, well, very much for me, it, it was really one thing developing into another because this, this goes back 42 years ago when I first started down this road and um, it's very much been a path of discovery and synchronicity actually as well, you know, just that which was the next, step to learn more and um so i would say over these 42 years really the first 20 years i was very much kind of on my own and discovering what i could through books and of course the internet didn't exist initially so it was very much about what i could find or what would be I, i'd be exposed to and different ideas and then um about halfway through and 20 years into it, then I, I met um, both Nassim Haramain, who's uh, I, you know, really one of the leading um, physicists or you know, theoretical physicists who is, who is pioneering what we call uh, unified physics. Uh, and okay. then I also met Foster Gamble, who created the Thrive film and also has worked with Nassim and has done very deep research into these. They've both done very deep research into the same foundational understanding that I had come to. Uh, and they were much more advanced in that more technical and scientific research. Uh, I'm, I'm much more artistic than I am scientific, although my mind loves to weave both. 
So I, I learned a huge amount from, from both of them and broadening my field of study and awareness that then you, you're asking about when did it become kind of a, more of a mission for me. And so it's really been in the past, you know, 15 years I've been like, okay, I'm honing in on, cause I had to figure out how to tell this story. It's a big story to tell. And my book, you know, was the culmination of over many years of creating presentations and, uh, just learning, yes, there it is, the big book. <laughs> learning how to present this very comprehensive viewpoint in a way yeah. that would ideally be accessible for people who have not even begun thinking that way or know this information much at all, and for those who have been. Um, and so it, it really, um, it, in the past 10 to 15 years, I've started to really hone in on that and really came together. Yeah. Um, a few questions talking about your book, right? Um, you talk about universe means a song. Mm. What do you mean with that? Yes, this word universe, universe. Um, so the, the idea, universe means one song. Uni is one, you know, singular, one, they're unified. And verse is a kind of a, a loose association to the idea of a song, you know, and the reason I say that, and I'm not the only one, I'm not the original one to say that, um, is because music, as we were just talking about at the beginning, um, in, in cosmometry, there are, there are three main lenses that you can look into the same whole system. Uh, one is the cosmic geometry that we were just talking about. One is unified physics that is based on this in Haramain's theory, which is also foundationally based on Buckminster Fuller's geometry. That's why they tie together so well. And my background in that comes into it. And the third, third lens is, um, is music. And the, there's a variety of reasons why that's so, but the one in relationship to this question is that we know through the study of, of physics and quantum physics that everything is in a vibrational state. All the matter is vibrational energy. And it's actually not even physical when you get down to that level. It's all energetic fluctuations within this unified medium of you know, the universe. And uh, as being a, being a vibrational system, it naturally has then resonance and dissonance relationships that are what com come together in the system that we call music. And as I say in the book, music is not something that we created or invented, it's something we discovered. And we can create and invent with music, but we did not invent music in and of itself. And so, so the the vibrational musical aspect of the universe is one song that's singing constantly. It's, it's happening everywhere. It's happening at all scales. It's all in relational, relational harmonic um, proportions, which are being discovered and found throughout, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the solar systems, the star systems, the galactic systems, all the way down into the small scale, the same kind of harmonic proportions. And so, yeah, it's, it's one beautiful song, this universe. <laughs> Is that when you talk also about the fundamental concepts of music? I believe you talk about harmonic structure, rhythmic structure, and 12 tone system, kind mm -hmm. of part of like the whole, you know, in yeah. the music. Yeah. Exactly right. Those are the basics there, you know, the harmonic overtone system. Um, is this the relational system of the, the sound that we make in the musical instruments and they all have a harmonic overtone system that's very mathematically precise, very much so. And very, it's all whole number ratios as well. Uh, and that was actually fundamental to Buckminster Fuller's geometry was that it has to be all whole number because that's what nature's doing. It's not, I mean, there are obviously fractional components but they're still whole in their whole number ratio relationships. And then rhythm, like you said, is another component, which is again, based on whole number relationships and a division of time in, in whole number relationships. And then the, the 12 tone system of music, 
which is not the only system of music. Um, you know, there are many, many ways of dividing uh, a musical octave and different music around the world, you know, uses all sorts of different systems for that. The most, um, I think the most basic and the most sort of um, readily relatable to our ear is the 12 tone system. And it, and it happens to be that the foundation of the geometry and the physics is also a, a 12 around one system. And so there's a direct correlation between wow. that 12 tone system and the geometry that Buckminster Fuller identified as being the geometry of the zero point field, the geometry of basically the geometry of silence mm. <laughs> and stillness is a 12 around one system. And then in the physics model as well, it's the same geometry and the same foundational um, framework. So that's why music, I believe, is you know, directly correlated to, the, to that whole system. Mm. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned also like I offer com cosmometry as an imperfected yet important step in the process of aligning our intellectual and spiritual insight with the nature of nature. Mm. Right? Yes. So, well, so the you were talking about kind of my my purpose and and mission for bringing this this information into us, this synthesis that I, I've done, which is really synthesizing um, various people's um, prior research, especially Buckminster Fuller, Nassim Haramein, uh, the physicist David Bohm, um, the, um, a man named Richard Merrick, who really, I think, has pioneered a foundational understanding of what he calls harmonic science, or what we can call harmonic science, the science of the harmonic system of the universe. And I strongly feel that um, we humans are operating in a very dissonant, uh, and disharmonious relationship with nature. Yeah, you talk about in some way like feedback, right? Like we can see yeah. what is happening in some way, just paying attention to the results of what is happening, right? Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. We get constantly feedback, and that feedback is actually a fundamental attribute of, of, um, and we'll get into this actually of consciousness itself, mm -hmm. and the the way the universe operates to inform itself at all scales is through feedback, and so we're constantly getting feedback about. How we're doing here and we know right now we know in this world that uh things are very much out of balance things are very much out of harmony and by having this understanding we can actually um see and and study and come to learn how nature is working harmoniously and they're just like i said there's geometric patterns there's ratios there's the harmonic resonance aspects all of which can inform us and will and do inform us how we as human beings can bring ourselves back into harmony with nature mm -hmm. because nature in the universe is already fully harmoniously operating <laughs> it never is not doing that and you know we have this remarkable capacity as humans to kind of do what we feel like we mm -hmm. call free will and uh, we've deviated greatly from that. So we have the opportunity to take this knowledge and study it and apply it into how we come back into harmony with, with nature, with the earth, with the cosmos. Mm. Uh, I think that's vitally important at this time. So how do you do that? <laughs> how, how do we do it? Yeah. So first of all, to have this knowledge, and you know, my, my book is like a, a, an introduction and an overview and a synthesis of the idea, the concept itself. You know, okay, there's patterns that we see throughout the cosmos. There are, uh, there are harmonic relationships and systems that we can understand. We can see how that's operating at the atomic scale. We can actually understand how it's operating at the subatomic scale and all the way up through a, a fractal system that is operating at every scale mm -hmm. up through from the atomic up through into our biological systems and into the natural world 
actually into our social and you know mental and emotional systems as well it's all the same thing and then all the way up through you know to the greater scales so by understanding those relationships and how we can actually interact consciously and purposefully with those harmonious relationships we can then we can then essentially tune ourselves bring ourselves back into tune and and, and in, in a very practical way that means to to look at our technologies especially and see how they're not beneficial how they're actually creating harm and 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 you know they're detrimental uh especially the electromagnetic technologies we have now but really all of them um chemical you know so many uh and our social systems themselves that are not patterned off of these same kinds of dynamics and relationships we can look at all of that and choose to align ourselves and tune ourselves back into a relationship that will be beneficial to our biology, beneficial to the nature. And when we do it, we'll quickly, quickly restore. Um, it actually will happen very quickly, I think. Yeah, I think in some way also you talk about how, if I understand you correctly, you know, we are set when we are in this society to some specific norms of being you know like there is a lot going on that is influencing us as you know individuals mm -hmm. and it's kind of like finding a way to really figure out what it really matters and makes a difference and is creating in a state of other things in some yes. way into something that is not necessarily maybe what we have been told to to do or be correct we're really actually talking about a, a, a paradigm shift um, because our scientific model which has informed our social structures our economic systems our medical systems um, and and the other primary systems that are operating are, are based on a paradigm that is um, is limited and very much uh, a kind of materialistic and reductionist approach that is not comprehensive. That's where Buckminster Fuller's way of studying the universe, and uh, he was a um, an inventor, a designer, and inventor as well. And he was always looking how to create wholeness and establish wholeness and integrity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scientific model of unified physics and the cosmometry is all about that. And so. It's a shift from a kind of disconnected worldview, scientific and therefore social, and even uh, not so much spiritual, because spiritual is actually all about the, the unification aspect. But it's taking the scientific and social and shifting it into a connected, uh, unified, practical, not just idealistic and spiritual, but very practical scientific perspective as well. And, um, you know that it's it's a very profound time uh, again of the opportunity to make that kind of a shift mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um your personal path to this understanding integrated more um excuse me integrated mood of wholeness the three fields we talk about three fields uh cosmic geometry unified physics and music that we talked about before should we, top, yeah, should we tap into the cosmic geometry and the unified physics also? Sure. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> again, when we talk about each of these, they're just a lens to look at the same thing. That's, I repeat that throughout my whole book, and it may be not so obvious at first, but, and it's actually fundamentally very simple, this model. Mm -hmm. And again, it may be a little hard to get to that simple understanding, but the, the idea is that, the, the cosmic geometry is, um, it's cosmic because it spans from, as we we're just saying, the, the subatomic scale down to what's called the Planck scale, and even smaller than that. It is, it's unimaginably small. We cannot conceive of a <laughs> scale intellectually, but it's, it's known in physics, and it's a very valid point of, um, point of measurement uh, at the Planck scale, then all the way up through the atomic scale, Again, up and through our biological systems, planetary systems, solar systems, gal galactic systems, superclusters of galaxies, there's actually evidence 
uh, that the geometric relationships, um, both in terms of the kind of the vorticular, the, the, the spiraling aspects, and then the torus aspects, which is the dynamic kind of unified flow process. That's- I wanted happening. to ask you about that one too, the torus. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go into that more. Uh, but as well then, the, this zero point geometry, equilibrium geometry, that is what was foundational to Buckminster Fuller's insights, have been discerned, have been actually found and seen at every scale, every scale. And so the cosmic geometry is the, the understanding of those relationships and those patterns. That's why it's the study of the patterns and the structures, which are the, the, the relationships that cohere into structures. And the processes is the torus flow aspect because everything is always evolving and vibrating. Um, so that's, that's the cosmic geometry aspect. And the unified physics is the application of that into or, or taking that foundational understanding and applying it into studying the physics of the universe. Um, and that's when I <clears throat> was first introduced in this um, and he saw his presentation for the first time. He was referencing Buckminster Fuller's geometry as foundational to his model of physics. And I hadn't studied physics much, so I, I, you know, that was a little bit of a stretch at the time. I've since learned a lot from him. But, mm. but when I first saw that, I thought, this guy's right, you know, because he's basing it on this model, I think he's actually correct. And so, uh, and, and it's actually proven to be very much so. Um, and so his, his unified physics model um, is essentially bringing back the wholeness that was in some ways removed from physics because uh because it's it it posed problems <laughs> basically it showed that there's infinity at every point in the universe <laughs> and that was a little difficult to reconcile so they took that out but by putting it back um, there's basically kind of an infinite energy potential at every point in the universe and when you put that back into the physics model you can now address and 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 resolve many big questions that the, the current mainstream model of physics has had a hard time reconciling because that part was removed. Mm -hmm. um, so without getting too technical, it, it, um, it combines all of that into a unified model that, that allows for the wholeness to be present. And when it is, it reconciles um, the big problems and is also based on resonance and harmonics. So, yeah. Is that related also what you were talking before about the quantum physics in some way, the quantum field, and a different way to explore that kind of, you know, way? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 I think the challenge for people with the idea of the quantum field is um, it's a term that uh, I think is pretty abstract for most people. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, we don't really, it's, it's not defined. It's just this tiny little thing. Basically people think, oh, that's that tiny little scale. Um, the significant aspect of that, that scientific field, and especially that term quantum, quantum physics, quantum, that word quantum means that there are discrete packets or quanta of energy, like light and sound, you know, but it was initially the study of light that um, Max Planck and then Einstein proved that light travels in little packets or quanta. And so this, this, this field of energy that we are not only in, but we're made of is actually this quantized field. And so the quantum field is the vibrational field. Basically, you could in a very simple way, you could say, you know, it's it's that foundational field um, that's called the quantum field or quantum mechanics is the study of the then the, what comes from that field are these different structures. And they're very much vorticular toroidal structures that come into relationships and those relationships create they create everything from protons and then the protons come together to create atoms and then to create molecules and then they create 
crystals and proteins and cells. And so the whole thing is this scaling fractal quantized system. And that's why <clears throat> it's foundational to understanding really the nature of, of the universe. Um, and it's very abstract for most people. And again, when you just look at it as quantized relationships, it helps us to, to sim simplify it a bit, I think. Mm. Uh, and that's certainly what made it more accessible for me and how I present it as well. Yeah, and then it's also related, it's all related, right? It's all kind of like there is a correlation between that and us as individuals. It's all in some way one, if I... And accessing what did you think? Like an, um, the quantum field and as yeah. an individual, there is a continuous uh, correlation between, between us and that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly right. We are that field. <laughs> there's, there's always a correlation. Um, so if you imagine <clears throat> coming into our, you know, we, we have these bodies. We know these bodies are made of cells. We know those cells are made of molecules and we know those molecules are made of atoms and we know those atoms are made of protons and electrons. And we're getting down to the point now where as quantum physics has shown, when you get to this point, you're no longer talking about physical matter. You're talking about energy fluctuations and you know, the, the relationship between protons and electrons in an atom, it's 99.99999% empty space. Mm -hmm. And so the material aspect of the universe is just the tiniest fraction of what's really going on. And that's foundational to our physical being. You know, we literally are a fluctuation of that field. And we're, we're in constant relationship. And that field, as has been shown, has non-local properties, what they call entanglement, you know, uh, very much proven to that one energetic event can instantly affect another one, another point within the field at any distance, uh, so-called faster than the speed of light, which is supposed to be the speed limit of the universe, <laughs> oh, wow. but it's, it's actually not. <laughs> oh, wow. And that's, that's because the whole thing is, is really operating as a hologram. Yes. Uh, and so that when you, you know, that's kind of the umbrella term for the concept about the, the wholeness and the connection to every point is actually present at every point in the universe. Um, so the quantum field is constantly what we're interacting with. There's no way not to. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you put that together with consciousness? Yes. So, um, which brings us to the topic of your summit here, Universal Consciousness. I know. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the, the simple way of bringing that correlation in is to, to think of, and, and this is another kind of fun, foundational um, conceptual premise in my book, which is that there are three components that make up our experiential reality. There's the light, the field of light or electromagnetism that's permeating everywhere throughout the entire universe. <clears throat> then there's the sound aspect, which is the acoustical. It's a pressure wave within that electromagnetic medium. You get pressure waves and that's sound or the acoustical aspect. And the acoustical, acoustical aspect is what makes form in the universe mm -hmm. um, because form is a compression of the field which wow. is the same as as pressure like sound so it's all an acoustical it is thin. Mm -hmm. yeah and then the third component is the information aspect and the information is kind of most simply understood as the in the the pattern relationships of all these fluctuations that are interacting forming these these wave patterns at every scale um, and so uh it's it's really the it's really understood to be and more so in, in science to be uh, a foundational 
level, you could say, that sound and light are the carriers of, and they combine to create the, this, this informational matrix. And the informational level is even in a way kind of there prior to those, that expression in sound and light. So when you include that into the picture of the universe as this functional dynamic system, then, and then you also combine the feedback aspect that you mentioned, the feedback loop, because that's what's occurring is there's a informational that. field that's evolving. And mm -hmm. so that like here, you know, you're where, you're where you are, I'm where I am. And we're in this local experience and we can see what's around us. That's the field that's local to us. And we're getting feedback constantly from that field. And we're introducing information into that field all the time. Mm -hmm. That's our consciousness, our, our, well, we'll get to the consciousness in a moment, but our biological system, <laughs> et cetera, is constantly informing the field and the field is constantly informing. And every moment that's circling and cycling and updating in a feedback loop. <clears throat> now the, the experience we have, that we call consciousness, um, has certain attributes of, of awareness and self-awareness and reflex, reflection, reflexivity, this feedback loop. It has, <clears throat> you know, logical analysis. It has, has uh, receiving input and responding to input. Very much these are, you could say, the kind of basic attributes of what we would call, okay, that, that's, that anyone who experiences those attributes has consciousness, anything that, mm -hmm. that has that. Well, you could then s extend the understanding of that, that model or that framework into the rest of the universe and see those attributes are actually present. So throughout the entire universal structure and dynamic process are the attributes of awareness, uh, awareness of self and other, interaction and relationship, <clears throat> information inputs, decision-making and response. These are, you know, basic attributes that are, are seen at the quantum in the, in the way that electrons behave and plasma fields um, very much have been kind of a, given a, a sort of a, a, an understanding that they behave very much with a living intelligence. These are just electrons in, in a, moving you know free electrons moving together they take on an organized awareness you could say mm -hmm. so this informational aspect this feedback aspect it permeates the entire universe and then organizes in greater degrees of complexity mm -hmm. and we are a highly complex organized system and <clears throat> As such, we have come to this point where we have this self-reflective feedback loop awareness. And so then we call that consciousness. And we have our experience of it. So when you think about, I mean, basically the way, the way I look at it, consciousness is everywhere. There's nowhere that is not consciousness. And it's not the same as human consciousness. <laughs> you know, we have our version of it. I have to ask you about that too. <laughs> yeah. And so that's good. We have our version of it, but to try to ascribe our version of what consciousness is to the rest of the universe is to try to limit what consciousness is. Yeah. And when you just think of the whole entire field being a field of consciousness uh, expressed through sound and light and information, it starts to, in my mind, it starts to make a lot more sense actually. And then you can even begin to explain phenomena like, remote viewing or, you know, um, a clairvoyance or, you know, psychic abilities, things like that, mm. because it's all a universal field. To be able to access to it because it's, we are part of it and it's just like learning the way to, to do it. So yeah, exactly. Connect to that. Which is already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually, um, <clears throat> after I wrote my book, I had this thought that Consciousness cannot perceive something that's not itself. 
you know, so our perception, we see the world, we see these things that look like they're separate from us and all that. Mm -hmm. And we think, well, that's a rock, you know, doesn't have consciousness. And yet I, I came through my realization is that consciousness actually can't perceive something that's not itself. We, we, the only way the universe exists is by, in our awareness, is through consciousness being present. And it's not just something happening in our brain. It's actually a, a relationship to this whole field of consciousness. And I don't think consciousness can perceive something that isn't consciousness. So. Huh. The way that I was thinking the other day about it is like if consciousness is all of us, is all of this, but we only have the capability that we have as human beings and with our limitations to perceive a tiny little bit of it is here, is, you know, but how we, per like everything else, how we create our life based on our beliefs is in our own subjective points of view. So, yes. Yeah. So. Yes. We have, a, well, you're right, that's, I think that's a very important uh, realization is that <clears throat> our human experience is in a very, very small bandwidth, like the visible light spectrum is the tiniest little fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. And how can we gather the whole concept of it, if, you know, yeah. as, uh, to just yeah. listen into it? It's, a, it's uh, an important realization because then it extends the idea of what our relationship to the universe and consciousness is beyond that little framework. Yeah. yeah. And then how do you differentiate from the human consciousness experience? Like how do you separate, even though in some ways it's all related, how do you separate one or if you separate one from the other? I think the more you come into an awareness that that's a universal field of consciousness, the less you separated okay. yeah you know yeah. really and and then but there's a relationship you know it's important to acknowledge that um you know we we very much have a human experience of consciousness and of the world um you know and the world we create we're creators we're co-creators with this whole field and we have a very particular experience as human beings uh that we we you know, we, we put a lot of attention into it. Um, and so it's very easy to stay within that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we evolve, we have our version of it now in our world that, you know, the past 50 to 75 years brought in communication systems and the media, television, and then the internet. And all of that is actually a feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. And we're, so we're actually getting this, this really intense reflection of what human consciousness we think I it is. I was thinking right? about the same the other day. It's like, we are doing it. <laughs> and, and it's good. It's actually good because that feedback loop is what will propel us to make the change we have to make. Because I think, I think people all over the world are waking up to this like, wait a minute, this is not... There's something wrong <laughs> with this picture. I mean, I, it's, it's getting very, very obvious and, you know, very critical as well. Um, and so then when through, you know, experiences we have in life can then expand us beyond that framework, we have then, uh, we can have experiences that, that transcend that version of what consciousness is and go into something that even transcends our personality egoic self that suddenly we'll go like wow this is very much what happened to me when i had that frying pan waking I up like about that one. <laughs> yeah yeah it was sort of like whoa you know can you tell us like, a little more about that one would you would you like to say a little more about that one about what happens yeah um, if you, yeah, think about, you don't have to, but like, I feel like sometimes when we go through these kind of experiences and we share, it kind of opens the possibility for people that maybe haven't tapped into that to, yeah. to see what is available and for people that maybe they have tapped but they don't know what to make of it to have some clarity. So it's why. Sure, I yeah. Well, and actually, I think it's interesting as you're saying that <clears throat> I think my experience in a way applies very much to the experience we're having collectively now. Um, which is that 
So when I was 19, I, uh, in my first year of college, I came to this point where I was uh, basically just terrified <laughs> and emotionally distraught and lack, complete lack of self-identity. I like, I have no idea, you know, who I am. I, I, I don't even know how to even access that. Uh, I, was in, I was in a crazy environment uh, with lots of crazy kids around me <laughs> in school. And I got very um, enraged. I got very angry at everything around me. Um, and I was blaming everything around me, you know, the kids, the school, the whole thing. I was just raging. And um, pretty much kind of at the peak of that rage, and I won't go into the, there's, there's some funny things about the circumstances that I won't go into right now, but um, uh, at the peak. Happening. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. And um, well, I'll tell one little story because it's kind of funny that um, in the peak of that rage, I, I vented and I, 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 I scribbled some words onto this wall that was next to me. And it was in a disgustingly fluorescent lit yellow painted study room, you know, <laughs> studying. And I vented my rage. Um, and I think just a few minutes after that, this thought came in to my mind that I was creating the whole thing. Wow. That was it. That was it, just that thought. I'm creating the whole thing. And that one thought just popped that bubble, right? That whole victim bubble, you know? Yeah. It just popped it right then and there. And then that's why I said it just popped me into a different state of awareness. I didn't mean I was suddenly healed and I got it all together. <laughs> it's just as the beginning. <laughs> I like that, was, that. <laughs> that was just like, okay, open the door. Now you can walk yeah. through. But then I, uh, it turned out that, uh, the next night I was in there and, and I read what I had written. And the funny thing, this is the kind of the cosmic joke, you know, uh, and, and this really is all big cosmic joke. I'm convinced <laughs> that we're in here, even though it gets pretty serious sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I wrote intrepid actualism will exist forever. Oh, you have to repeat that for me. What yeah. So intrepid actualism will exist forever. Intrepid is courageous and brave and, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. what it takes to get through and, and okay. go for it. Intrepid actualism. Actualism is like self-actualization. It's okay. the actualization of the universe. Okay. Will exist forever. It's a process that's going to go on and on and on and on and on. And so that's, that's guided me through my life. And I was, you know, like that's, that was my anger venting. Came out. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that statement <laughs> you can tell it was like from somewhere else entirely <laughs> that's a very good way to you know kind of like move through the anger and find yeah know, answers and then like oh by yeah. the way you know your yeah. higher mind is actually telling you this <laughs> which color pencil were you using <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. so i and i think that like i said i think that relates to the time we're in very much because we're in a time of questioning our identity as a as a whole human species in a big way questioning the truth of what we're being told you know kind of across the board at this point and looking for something that feels true and real to us to actually to actualize to have the courage to actualize a higher state of being and we're in a very emotionally distraught and scared and in some ways terrified state in the world as a whole so that same process i believe is actually happening right now the question is and i agree with what you're saying is once that hopefully things normalize normalize a little yeah. bit uh, how do we do that we don't forget about all of this like all the lessons and all the gifts because so many times we have gone through this kind of like crisis not specifically this kind and then mm -hmm. we seem to have amnesia, amnesia like forget about mm. go back to to where we were so how can we hopefully hopefully we were a little more stressed than normal <laughs> and yeah. we the stress even though if we come back it won't be where we were at least it will be you know a little more i don't know this is it's such a good question Mike. it's it's essential actually i think at this time because the the normal that was was leading us towards catastrophe 
um, very quickly. And I think pretty much anybody who's paying attention to the collapse of natural systems, the extinction rate, the pollution in the world, um, the inequities, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, that version is not what we want mm -hmm. now. And so what do we want? Yeah, if, if it's not working, why we keep doing the same? Exactly. And so there, there's lots of layers that we can unpack around that, um, including those who created that system don't want it to go away because it gives them control and power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a very logical understanding. Uh, yet that's now really detrimental to the whole experience here. Um, and so there's that aspect of obsoleting that. Now, how do you obsolete that? Well, you bring in the new paradigm of scientific understanding and the new technologies as just you know the technological aspect to make that shift and the information like we are doing in some way and the information exactly yeah. so the tech the information of the science informs then the technologies that we can create the the, the resonance and the, the tuning of our technological sphere and then also the same information uh this unified understanding then informs how we create our social systems, our societal structures, um, how, how we choose to um, heal ourselves in medicine through resonance and vibration rather than chemicals, um, how we create energy uh, from the field cleanly, which these technologies all exist already. Um, the understanding scientifically is there, the technical, technological development goes back to Nikola Tesla, you know, if he were not um, shut down when he was, we would have a whole different world right now. And Walter Russell, since him, but Mr. Fuller. Um, but these, all these things already exist and have been suppressed because that, that, that system in place is, it will become obsolete. <laughs> it's no longer needed to burn fossil fuels or use petrochemicals and agriculture and pesticides and, um, and pharmaceuticals the way we are you know there's maybe a place for those in small very discreet specific uses but the way it is now is just rampant and it's causing all these problems so that possibility and choosing it once we go there we won't forget mm. yeah. yeah we'll be there yeah and then that becomes what's normal mm. and that old thing that we didn't like so much anymore <laughs> that just will fall away and we can stabilize our world and, and really create a harmonious and peaceful world because we know how to do it now. yeah yeah and i guess also unity or knowing that there is more relation between us than sometimes we think we have is also important to to know it's, it's yeah. very important to know and and that's, all, that's traditionally been a very challenging aspect of our human journey is the whole re religious, racial, you know, uh, cultural, all these so-called divides, which are all an illusion. They're all constructions we made up. Um, you know, it's sort of like a frame of reference that we can either buy into and perpetuate, or when we really understand the unification, those are just relative aspects of one unified wholeness yeah really. and even we don't even have to exclude them you know like i feel like maybe sometimes you think or you choose one or you choose or the other but why not to choose it all and just become you know there yes. is the nature is, is teaching us how everything in some ways working exactly. our bodies you know everything works together so you know it's very diverse. It's, yeah. a, it's just, yeah. just a huge diversity. And that's what makes healthy ecosystems possible, mm -hmm. including our bodies, is just a, a complex diversity working cooperatively together and evolving. You know, sometimes it gets out of balance and it collapses and it needs to restore balance. These things happen. Mm -hmm. We're going through that right now. But the, the cultural diversity um, is to be celebrated, you know, and to be embraced. And basically we humans just gotta get over our fear of each other. Mm. You know?
that's causing so much problem. And it's actually a fear of ourselves. Um, so. Do you think it's a fear of ourselves? Why do you say that? Because um, once we become peaceful inside of ourselves, then the world around us is, is you know, again, it's the feedback loop. And so when we get out of our own fear of our own self, in, you know, like our own self power, yeah. for example, <laughs> Yeah. Um, our own creativity, our own expression, when we get ourselves centered into ourselves and can release those, some of it is, you know, imprinted patterns from childhood or ancestral lineage um, patterns, cultural yeah. worldview patterns, religious, yeah. you know, all these, yeah. all yeah. these things that come in when we release how can we, from see? Those. how can we see with all of these coming from all different directions, right? And yeah. Yeah, by just kind of coming into our center and, um, you know, getting more into that universal state of consciousness that is just as real and just as present as all the worldly stuff. And yeah. that, again, is all part of that shift where it's, it's centering ourselves in that where we become uh, embracing and therefore not fearful in ourselves and fearful with others. Because mm. um, fear is really driving so much of the challenges we're facing. Yeah. Now. yeah. Um, a few questions, but I have to keep it in order. So, <laughs> sure. uh, uh, the next opt, I mean, should I go one way or the other? Maybe I should go. I am going to go. I was going to ask you something more about your book, but now that you're bringing this into the conversation, I don't want to separate from it. Sure. Oh, do you mind if I ask you how do you keep how do you help yourself to be grounded, connected, and more in tune with that unity and universal consciousness? Right? Do you have any practices or reminders or you know mm. things that you have done that feel like is helping you to stay? Absolutely. Yeah, it's um it's, it's, it's a very important aspect of um, getting through this, <laughs> this life, <laughs> having some ways that we can center ourselves, be grounded, um, clear ourselves of the, the dynamics that can throw us off center. And I believe you're going to say with us one, one of them, right? By the end of the I will, yes, we can do that. All we right. can do that together. Uh, All right. I'll guide you through that and everybody else listening. Um, and so, yeah, there are, there are many, there are numerous practices. Of course, meditation uh, in all its different forms is, uh, is one. But I guess fundamentally, I would say, um, mostly across the board, unless you're doing some very active martial art kind of practice, which is all about mastery. You know, it's all about coming into your mastery. And so there's the very active physical practices like I use a Joe staff which is a wooden staff from martial art um, practice I, I use it more for my own exercise and centering than I do as a weapon but um, you know there's the active side and then fundamental to all of it is actually is, is accessing the stillness within ourselves because in, in that stillness we uh, become aware of the universal field because the universal field has stillness at the center everywhere. Every point in the universe is a point of stillness. Um, and uh, we can center ourselves in that stillness. And when we do, we become integrated and we become much more flexible. You know, we have more fluid capacity to move with the energies that are around us because we're actually staying in the stillness and in the center at the time. Are you talking about this? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. In your book. <laughs> That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. Sorry, keep going, sorry. Well, so in terms of just basic fundamental practice for me uh, and for many, most everybody I know who's you know engaging in some kind of a practice to, like you said, to to come into a relationship with that's, that's more grounded and, and stable is very much about centering ourselves and coming into that stillness at the center. And, um, you know, when you'd like to do so, we can do that. The simple practice I learned that has actually guided me very much through my journey. 
a couple of more questions, if it's sure. okay. And this one's, yeah. Uh, one is Denes Ochtaf. I don't know if I am pronouncing it correctly. Denes Ochtaf or Ochtaf. Yes. For a vision of the world we can create. And also I would like to ask you for the Resonance Academy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you talk about those two things? Yes. Do you mind? No, I'd love to. <laughs> Okay. Um, so the first, the next octave, yes, um, which is the last section of my book. The title of that section is, is because, um, again, going to the musical aspect of the universe, um, the, the most basic relationship uh, in music, ratio in music, is the octave, which is when you take one frequency and then you, you, t you double that frequency. So you take, it's, it's, let's say it's 20 cycles per second and you go to 40 cycles per second it's the same note in musical terms like if this is the note a then this is also the note a at the next octave and there's another octave and octaves below so it's a division of the harmonic space in a doubling system that's what an octave is it's, just, it's that simple and um in music you know there's a, there's a whole different feel when you go down to these and of course the whole range of music is playing at these different octaves and the 12 tone system of music is present within each octave this is why it's a fractal and holographic system but especially a fractal system because the same pattern is repeated at every scale mm -hmm. now i refer to this next octave and the vision that I present in, in the book as um, what we're experiencing now. Because when, when two notes are coming together, just before they come together, there's this, this fluctuation, what is it called a beating effect, where it's like, blah, 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 you know, like, whoa, and it's very dissonant and very, gets kind of almost chaotic. Mm -hmm. And then when they come into unison together at this uh, next octave, all of a sudden everything goes Whoa, like that. You know, it's like, oh, it sounds so good and it feels so good and it's all calm and relaxed and resonant and harmonious. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we're actually literally going through a shift from one octave of mm -hmm. our experience to the next octave. And we're right at that point where we're about to make the last step into yeah. the resonance. And when we do, then, I mean, what we're experiencing now is the, is all that turmoil coming bef right before that. And that when we do what we just talked about before, apply all this knowledge and information to create the harmonious, resonating, you know, tuned system in our world, we'll have come to that point where we will come to the next octave. And everything is now resonating and, and, and is calm and harmonious. It's a very peaceful thing. When two notes come together, it creates a very peaceful uh, sound. Mm. So, so for me, it's, it's both a metaphor and I think somewhat literal, actually, yeah. vibrationally speaking. Mm. Yeah. It's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. And then the Resonance Academy. Um, so the Resonance Science Foundation is founded by Nassim Haramein, um, the physicist friend um, and colleague, uh, many years ago. And back in 2014, we launched, uh, I've I'm, I'm been on the board of directors of the Resonance Science Foundation for many years. And uh, we launched the Resonance Academy to teach about the unified physics. Um, and so people could understand the science, but also understand the worldview shift that it brings to our world from a disconnected model to a connected unified model and how that logically works. Um, so we launched an online course called, uh, we actually call it now, it's called Exploring Unified Science. And we just made that course free, um, <clears throat> I think about six weeks ago. And uh, so now it's, it's a very, very kind of robust online course uh, at resonancescience.org where if you're interested in diving into the unified science perspective and unified physics perspective um, and also the the it goes into the um, the the ancient origins and how we can see evidence of this understanding through the geometry and the patterns that that are found throughout ancient cultures um, 
and then also <laughs> the implications and applications of the science to what we can create now and the research that's being done uh, through Nassim and his colleagues, his researchers. Mm. So uh, wow. it's a great, it's a great resource. And, and, and then my book is very much uh, an introduction to that, that knowledge that's especially the unified physics. I, I cover a lot of those core concepts in there as well. Mm, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I have some other questions for you, but I think like we don't have the time. So if you would like to, to add, huh? I said it's up to you, however, however long you want to go. Um, I was curious, yes, about the fee scaling angle. Oh, uh, yeah. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so there's a... Um, one of the double spiral. Yes, the, 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 the double spiral pattern. Um, which is right here on the cover of my book in the sunflower. Okay. So uh, the, this pattern in the seed head here is a double spiral because there's spirals going in both directions. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the curvature of that spiral is based on the ratio called the golden ratio, or okay. um, what's typically called phi or phi is the proper pronunciation in Greek. Um, as you said it, but in, in here in the Western, you know, speaking cultures, we call it phi, the phi ratio. And it's found throughout all of nature. It's just everywhere um, throughout nature. And um, there's different ways. It's in spirals, it's in proportions. Um, and I discovered actually through my own kind of inquiry into this, um, this particular angle, Called, I call it the phi scaling angle. It's just when you take little circles and you grow them, the proportion of phi is 1.618 to one. Uh, so when you have something that's a, a circle of unit one, the next level up is 1.618 larger, and then larger again by that same ratio and larger again. And when you put some circles or spheres together like that, it creates a, an angle that I thought, well, that's fascinating. I wonder if I can find that anywhere. It turns out you can find it throughout all of nature. And you especially can see it in the bark of trees, mm. uh, this basket weave pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them, it's very, very clear and evident. And when I've put that angle on the pattern, it's just right on. It's amazing. Wow. And, and also on the sand on the beaches. When the, when the waves pull out and it leaves a basket weave pattern. Mm, yeah. I've spent many years at beaches over my life, I looked at that pattern and I bet you that's the same yeah. thing. And sure enough, it's exactly the same thing. So wow. mm -hmm. what's happening is that, uh, and, and we can kind of wrap up on your a question you didn't get uh -huh. to, it, which is about the torus. So the torus is this dynamic flow process that's spiraling and creating vortexes and everything. And uh, everything, you know, like the earth has a magnetic field, that's a torus. We have an energy field around us, that's a torus. Uh, the trees are torus systems. Atoms are torus systems. The sun is a torus. The, the, the solar, all of it, all of it. It's like the fractal scaling process, dynamic process. And, that spiraling motion that is being accommodated across all scale is is actually happening harmoniously through this phi ratio the golden ratio this this phi as you call it the 1.618 ratio found throughout all nature is oh, what wow. makes it possible for the whole thing to coordinate across all scales without conflicting with each other mm. that's why it's found everywhere and so the trees and the everything, the movement of water is all following that same dynamic. And that's why we see these patterns uh, repeated throughout all of nature, the sunflowers, the plants, the cactuses, the water movement, all of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. I have to finish the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take your time. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, incredible. Uh, all right, so I think before we go into the meditation, just because I think I would like to leave us all in that space as much as we can, uh, with the light that we all have. 
maybe you would like to share with us um, something that you would like to offer to the audience, a gift um, that they can find in your website. Do you mind? Would you like to? Sure. Share? I'd love to. So uh, my website is at cosmometry.com, C-O-S-M-O-M-E-T-R-Y.com, uh, which is um, where you can learn about my book and uh, order my book there. And there's some other links. And there's an area um, which I call additional resources, which um, basically, you know, my book is a big, fat, <laughs> lots of fully illustrated book that covers a lot of information and yet there's so much more that i did not put in here that i'm beginning it's, it's in the beginning phase to to um to add those resources so that when you're reading my book you could go to the same chapter online and get more information of that uh, maybe like a video or a research paper or whatever it might be so when you access that uh, area when uh and you put your email address in to get to that area, then uh, there's um, a, a very simple one-pager PDF file that explains some of the core concepts that are found in cosmometry. Um, a dear friend of mine, Randy Langle, had, uh, had the inspiration and, and the generosity to take this information out of my book and some from The Sims Physics and make these one-pagers very simplified, more accessible kind of like distillations. And so, um, so that will be available as a, as a free gift on thank the website. You. Thank you. And talking about gifts also, thank you so much for sending this one. Thank you so well. Very, very nice. About yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah. All right. So tell us what to do. <laughs> okay. So we're going to just, have a, a few minutes here um, in a practice that I um, oh, well, I learned it when I was 19 actually um, pretty much immediately after I had that frying pan wake-up experience one of the other great synchronous blessings that happened for me was um, to study the martial art of Aikido uh, and Aikido is specifically created by the founder of Aikido, uh, Morohai Ueshiba, uh, back in the 1930s and 40s, as he realized that the whole purpose of the martial arts was self-mastery and harmonizing with the universe. <laughs> and so Aikido literally means the way of harmonizing with the life force energy. And when I studied Aikido um, in my first year of college, the particular school of Aikido had an emphasis of putting your attention on the key energy. Key energy is that life force energy that's moving through everything. Same as chi in Chinese or uh, prana. And so to put your attention on the key energy and coordinate your mind and body. So it's mind and body coordination and a, a real emphasis on understanding the key energy. And so they taught um, very four basic principles uh, that are foundational to this practice. So let's let's begin now, just going into that experience together, and I'll guide through the practice and these principles as we do. And so the first principle is very very simple. It's just to relax. And so while we're here, we can just relax as much as we can in our chair or wherever we're laying down, just relax your body. And then the second principle is to drop the weight of your body to the underside. So like the bottom, the lower part of your arms and legs, just let everything drop, let gravity just drop it down. So you're relaxed and now you're feeling the weight bringing you down into the earth. And it, it relaxes you even more. Um, you can really feel that happening in your body. And then the third principle is to put your attention on what they taught as the one point. And you showed that little diagram in my book uh, or illustration. It's a point in the center of our belly, just below the, the belly button, below the navel. In the center of our belly is, is a energetic point there. 
And we just drop our attention all the way down to that point in the belly. And so now we're relaxed, our weight is underside, and our attention is centered in the belly. And if you want to put your hand there to give your mind a better orientation to drop all the way down into the belly, it helps to do so sometimes. And now that we've established that connection there, the next thing we do is we radiate energy like a star shining from that point in the belly. We radiate the key energy. And so you just picture now a star shining from that point and you can feel it coming out your fingertips and your feet, not your head and not your back and your front, just literally radiating in all directions from that point. And so just sit with that just for a moment and just feel what that feels like inside yourself, centered into your belly, relaxed, completely relaxed, the weight on your side, your attention is in your one point in the belly and you're radiating your energy. You may even feel it in your fingers and toes. I, I very much feel it. Um, in that way. And now when we do this, and this is why they taught it in Aikido, when you do that simp simple pra practice, which you can do anywhere, anytime, standing in the line, driving your car, doesn't matter, <laughs> anytime. Uh, when you do that, when you drop into that point, radiate your energy, relax, weight on your side, you become incredibly physically stable, like so powerfully stable, um, Aikido masters, when they're fully dropped into that place, they cannot be pushed over, they cannot be budged, they cannot be lifted off the ground. Five guys can try to knock them over. It can't happen because they're so centered in that stillness and there's so much power in that, that it, it stabilizes us in our physical being in a very, very profound way. And so it's, it's a very, it's so helpful, this practice, uh, when we're feeling unstable in ourselves, to just stop and drop into that center in our belly, relax, and then radiate that energy out. And I want to then add there are two more of these points that are uh, found in traditional Chinese energy systems, uh, and they call them Dantian in Chinese. In Aikido, they just call this the one point. Um, but these are the Dantian. So the one in the belly is the lower Dantian. And we've now established this foundation of a centered, radiant state of being in ourselves. And then the next one is in the higher heart area. And it's the same kind of energetic point. And I, I consider these points as a bit more fundamental than the chakra energy points that you know, people are very much familiar with. Um, kind of more essential in a way. And so you can bring your attention while still staying present in your belly, you can lift your attention up into this higher heart point. Again, right in the center of your body, still relaxed, still centered in the belly and centered and relaxed in your body. And find that point in your higher heart and do the same thing, just radiate it. Just let it shine, let it radiate. It's an inexhaustible supply of energy. You'll never, ever use it up. <laughs> and let that radiance just permeate out through into the space around you and into the whole field around you, into the whole universe. And you can feel now the radiance in your belly, the radiance in your higher heart. And the belly is giving the higher heart some stability to then go into that state with. It's like the engine that allows that to become stable in the higher heart. So we have those two established. And then the third one is right in the center of our head. So while keeping the first two radiating and relaxed and stable, you can bring your attention up to the center of your head and see the third point. It's called the upper Dantian. You've got the upper, the middle, and the lower Dantian working all together. And so once again, while staying relaxed and 
Letting your, your weight drop down into the earth, radiating your belly, radiating your heart. Now just see that point of light turn on in your head. Again, it's just a conscious choice and action to radiate like a star shining. Just feel that energy radiating. Inexhaustible supply because it's coming from the universal field. It's, it's both consciousness and life force energy coordinating together. And you may well feel that radiance in your head. I feel it very much radiating through my whole, my whole brain, my head, out beyond, into the field, this beautiful starlight radiance. So now we have three points in the head, in the heart, and in the belly. And by centering ourselves in these points, like I said, the first one stabilizes us in our physical being and very, very, very powerfully. The second one in the heart stabilizes us in our emotional being. So when we're feeling a little bit emotionally in turmoil or off center, to sit and just drop ourselves into that awareness, first going into the belly because we really need to stabilize that first and then go into the heart center here, this Dantian. Breathe into it, relax, and start shining and radiating the energy. Stabilizes our emotional being into our higher emotional body. And then in the center of our head is stabilizing our mental body. Again, it's giving us a point of reference to stabilize our thoughts and let the energy flow outward. Because very often we, in our turmoil on the challenges of life and the conflicts, we constrict and we contract. That's very much a typical response. And so this practice can help us to, to reverse that and release that constriction and contraction and come into a state where we're allowing that energy to flow, that life force energy is flowing through us. And by doing so, it can help liberate some of those constrictions and contractions. Um, so uh, it's a very, very simple practice. Very just as simple as that. You can do it anywhere, anytime. No one even needs to know you're doing it. <laughs> and I could, again, you can do it while you're driving. You can do it while you're meditating, uh, walking. How did that feel for you? I love it. It's great. I, I have some grounding exercises and stuff that I do, but I haven't I haven't done it this way. So I am I'm very thankful for you to guide us through that process. I, I love it. I'm ready for another interview. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, really. I know it's very very refreshing, isn't it? Yeah, very nice. It was very nice. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. All yeah. right. So I think this is coming to. Not the end, and not the beginning, but yes. so I just wanted to say thank you again for everything that you have shared with us and the work mm -hmm. and the inspiration and the hope that you have for the world and you know the work that you are putting into it and everything else. So really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for all that. Thank you for inviting me to to have this conversation with you and for creating this this summit. Uh, your inspiration and your Pulling it together and, and offering this into the world is very important and timely. And I, I really recognize that and honor it. And I'm grateful for, for your doing that and for being able to participate with you in that. It's and a co-creation, right? It's exactly. <laughs> it's a co-creation. That's what we're here to do. Yeah. And to really bring these ideas and awareness and practices into our our daily experience and so um mm -hmm. it's been a real joy to be in this conversation with you today thank you okay. we'll be in touch thank you so okay. much okay you well Michael. you too